I'm terrified for his life. This is my partner, this is the father of my children, and of course, as a human being, as his wife, and as the mother of his three children, I want him back. I want him at home, with us, where he should be. But I also understand that he's fighting for something so huge, fighting for something so big, and that every voice like Vladimir's is absolutely crucially important for the future, not only of Russia, but of the entire world. Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishnan Giri Murthy, and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week would never normally have intended to be here, but she is here campaigning for the release of her husband, Vladimir Karamurza, who is a politician, really, who is now in jail in Russia, having spoken out against the war in Ukraine and against many other decisions by Vladimir Putin. He was a guest on Channel 4 News at the beginning of the war. I interviewed him when I was in Ukraine, just before he went to Russia from America, where he was staying. And shortly afterwards, he was arrested. Yevgenia Karamurza, welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Hello, Christian. Thank you very much for having me here. What is the latest with Vladimir's case first? Vladimir is still uh, kept at Moscow's fifth pretrial detention center where he awaits appeal. I think that we all know what this, uh, the outcome of this appeal will be. And after that, he will be transferred to a strict regime prison colony where he will be serving his 25-year prison sentence uh, for high treason, among other things, based on five public speeches that he made on different international platforms denouncing the war of aggression against Ukraine, uh, speaking about uh, political repression in Russia and the ever-growing list of political prisoners in the Russian Federation, speaking about total censorship of the media and the illegitimate character of the Putin regime after the 2020 so-called referendum that basically destroyed the country's constitution and made Vladimir Putin a czar forever. And even before the war began, he had been a long-standing campaigner, activist, involved in supporting the Magnitsky sanctions against Russia and political opposition in general. Hence such a harsh treatment. Vladimir has been in the opposition to Vladimir Putin since, well, since Vladimir Putin came to power over 23 years ago. And over all these years, he's been a, a very principled, uh, loud and uh, fierce critic of the Putin regime. Um, as you rightly pointed out, uh, he was involved and still is in the advocacy for the introduction of the Magnitsky legislation around the world. He joined this campaign together with his friend and mentor, Boris Nemtsov, in 2010. Um, and uh, for the first few years, they worked together closely with Bill Browder, promoting the adoption of such sanctions around the world. But in 2015, um, uh, Boris Nemtsov was assassinated on the Bolshoi Moskvarysky Bridge in Moscow. And uh, three months after that, my husband was poisoned for the first time. It happened in Moscow. The poisoning plunged him into a coma. He suffered a multiple organ failure. Uh, he was lucky enough to survive, even though the doctors gave him a 5% chance of survival. He was lucky to survive, and thanks to the efforts of the medical team, and I do believe thanks to his absolutely amazing inner strength. Um, it's, like it, it's a man who believes there is a lot to do. So, you know, he's not prepared to leave. Um, and uh, it took him over a year to get back to normal, to relearn how to walk and hold a spoon. For over a year, he was using a cane because he suffered peripheral nerve damage after the poisoning. And uh, still he refused to abandon his fight and leave Russia. And after his intense rehabilitation, intense physical rehabilitation in the United States, he returned to Russia and continued his work there. In 2017, again in Moscow, a second poisoning happened. The story developed in the same way. There was a coma, a multiple organ failure. Uh, the same medical treat team treated him. 
and uh, again, he survived. Uh, of course, uh, his polyneuropathy symptoms, uh, that peripheral nerve damage uh, that um, provokes the uh, loss of feeling in extremities, uh, remained, and uh, he had to fight that again to restore um, uh, restore the ability to walk and um, hold things in his left hand. And uh, again, uh, he refused to abandon his fight. And moreover, um, in his mind, the fact that he was being attacked in such way, not to intimidate, not to scare away from Russia, the intent was to kill. Otherwise, he would not have had a 5% chance of survival. You know, that's uh, when, you, uh, when you're given a 5% chance of survival, it means that the intention was to kill. Uh, to him, that was indeed a sign that he was doing the right thing, that his uh, work was hitting the regime at the right, in the right place, that it was effective and that um, it was important. So he continued. I mean, the, the last time I spoke to him was, was I think just over a year ago. And we talked to him about, did he not fear for his life? You know, um, I mean, looking back, you know, you, you kind of think, what on earth was he thinking going back to Russia? Um, it's not actually the decision to go back to Russia as much as it was a decision not to leave Russia. Uh, for years, Vladimir has been sharing his time between Russia, the United States and the rest of the world because his work was mainly done on the international stage. He has always been throughout the years the, the face of that Russia that people wanted to see, that people wanted to deal with, that democratic Russia, that Russia built on principle, on respect for human rights and international laws, uh, on the rule of law. That is Vladimir's vision for our country, has always been Vladimir, Vladimir's vision for our country. And that is another reason why he is such a threat to the current regime built on lies and on murder and on thievery. So it was uh, it was mainly the decision not to leave. And um, why this decision? Because Vladimir has always identified himself as a Russian politician. And to him, uh, he would not have the moral right to call on people to continue resisting from a safe distance. He uh, believes that he had to share the risks and challenges faced by Russians back home. And so he was there when the full-scale invasion had broken out. Um, he was there and um, uh, the only reason uh, he left was because our daughter, our oldest daughter was turning 16 and uh, he had never missed any birthdays of our kids. So he came to the United States to celebrate it with us. Because you were living there? Yes. We always believed that in order for Vladimir to continue his work as he saw fit, the kids needed to be safe. So yeah, the kids uh, live in the United States. Uh, so he came home uh, for a few days. We celebrated our daughter's birthday and then um, I tagged along because I, I had someone to um, leave our kids with and I tagged along. Um, to Europe to spend some time with him because he had events in London and Paris. And so um, we did all that. In Paris, he spoke at the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe hearing on political prisoners. And on April the 5th, he left for Moscow and I left for the United States. And that was the last time you saw him? That was the last time I saw him. Uh, he came to Moscow. He did a number of interviews. Um, calling Vladimir Putin a murderer and his regime a regime of murderers, well, basically calling a spade and spade, and uh, talking about uh, the importance of bringing those responsible for the act of aggression to, uh, to accountability. And then he was arrested on April the 11th. Did you think he was going to be arrested? Well, you see, the, uh, the risk uh, has for many years been for him not to really be arrested, but to be killed. I mean, this is someone who survived two assassination attempts, so the risk uh, of being arrested 
was not the highest one. And he's still held by the same people who tried to kill him twice because thanks to an independent investigation by Bellingcat, the inside and Der Spiegel after the second assassination, we know not only the names but the faces of those FSB operatives in the service of the Russian state, that team of assassins in the service of the Russian state that had followed Vladimir before both poisonings across the country, everywhere. And it is the same team of assassins that later poisoned Alexei Navalny with Novichok and the same team that had been following Boris Nemtsov before his assassination. So what did you think was going to happen when you parted in April? You know what, uh, leaving the life we've been living, I understand that in order for me to maintain some level of sanity, I have to, well, I think block some information, uh, of course. And I don't, I haven't been asking myself these questions for a long time. Um, I know what Vladimir is fighting for. And I am absolutely in admiration of his strength and I have deep respect for my husband's position and for his ability to push through all the all these risks and to work despite those risks being there to continue his work on behalf of Russian civil society and in support of political prisoners in Russia and against this murderous regime so because I know that he is fighting for um, something bigger than even his life. And I am terrified to pronounce such things so that I, I don't put them in, into words. I don't, I don't say things like that in my life. Because, of course, as a human being, I'm terrified for his life. This is my partner, this is the father of my children, and of course, as a human being, as his wife, and as the mother of his three children, I want him back. I want him at home, with us, where he should be. But I also understand that he's fighting for something so huge, fighting for something so big, and that every voice like Vladimir's is absolutely, crucially important for um, for the future, not only of Russia, but of the entire world. And th there are thousands of voices like that. In Russia, over the past year, only over the past year, over 20,000 people have been arrested or detained for protesting against the war, including at least 565 minors. Criminal proceedings were opened against at least nine of them, nine minors, before they reached the age of 18. I am a mom of a daughter who's 17. To me, this is unspeakable. And I don't want even just what the current regime is doing to Ukraine, trying to erase an independent, sovereign country from the face of Earth, committing basically a genocide of the Ukrainian people. All those atrocities. You can't stay silent in a situation like this. It's, it's, it's inhuman. It's immoral. It's... Um, so yes, I know what he's fighting for and I want to make sure that his voice, even though he's now in prison, continues to be heard as do the voices of all those Russian citizens who stood up and spoke against this absolutely unprovoked, horrible aggression, ag aggressive war against Ukraine. So what... what do you know of how he's being kept and, and what contact do you have? My contact with Vladimir is through his lawyers. I have not seen or spoken to him in over a year. He's still at Moscow's fifth pretrial detention center, kept at uh, the most secure block of that uh, prison, reserved for most dangerous criminals, like murderers, I don't know, rapists. And there is my husband sentenced to 25 years of a high treason. Do his lawyers get to see him? Yes. Uh, now that he's in Moscow, now that he hasn't yet been transferred to strict regime, where I'm sure visitation hours by lawyers will be quite different and uh, his uh, contact with the outside world will be limited to the maximum. Now that he's still in Moscow, um, he gets to see his lawyers. 
And uh, uh, so he has like three locks on his door, including on the feeding slot. He has uh, bars and barbed wire on his window. And every time he's transferred to to the courtroom, um, he's surrounded by four or five guards. He's in handcuffs and there is a dog present. And we are talking about someone who survived two assassination attempts and as a result is losing feeling in both his feet and his left hand. This is torturous and absolutely ridiculous. But he is a, he's considered a dangerous criminal. And that is one of the main goals of the Putin regime. Uh, there are two important narratives that the Russian population has been subject to throughout many years already. The first one is that um, Russia is surrounded by enemies. Everyone out there wants to see us on our knees. Everyone out there wants to see Russia's demise. And the second, well, because they cannot ignore that there is protest in the country. Yes, we're not seeing mass protests, but detentions and arrests are happening on a daily basis. And of course, it is important for the regime to represent, to portray these people as criminals, traitors, spies working for foreign governments or insane people. And this is why uh, persecution is very harsh. This is why everything in politically motivated cases like in Vladimir's happens behind closed doors, because of course they cannot allow these people to speak up, even if it's a courtroom, because their arguments are very solid. They could be able to counter propaganda very easily. They cannot allow for the population to see this. The population needs to see these people as traitors and criminals. Yeah. And if you, if you define yourself as the state the way Putin does, Absolutely. if you are against Putin, you are against the state. He puts, an equation. He puts an equation mark between an entire country and himself. And uh, his officials say that there is no Russia without Putin. And uh, thousands and thousands of people have been protesting against this. And uh, hundreds of thousands left the country were forced into exile because they do not accept this. And I believe that, you know, um, there is sometimes this narrative that all uh, Russians are the same, all Russian citizens are the same. Well, by uh, supporting such narrative, uh, these opinion makers or politicians in the West basically support Putin's narrative that there is no Russia without Putin and that equation between an entire country and himself. So how have you, how have you gone about approaching this campaign to get him out? Well, you see, there's a, a larger picture and uh, a smaller picture advocating for specific people. And uh, I, in that smaller picture, also, I do not only talk about Vladimir because uh, there are hundreds of political prisoners in Russia and many of them are kept behind bars with uh, serious medical conditions and they are not receiving proper medical care, which means that their lives are in constant danger. And uh, th this, this bigger picture uh, of mine campaigning that this, I don't know, or Vladimir's work, continuing Vladimir's work on his behalf, I, I haven't been able to determine exactly what it is I'm doing. It's basically Speaking just doing, doing the best I can under the circumstances, whatever it is. So um, in this bigger picture, the thing is, the only way for Russia to stop being a threat to itself and the entire world is for it to become a democracy. There is no other solution to the problem because if you somehow surround a country of 145 million with a, uh, with a fence, with an invisible fence and let it brew, it will brew for some time, yes, but then it will implode. And the results are going to be even more catastrophic than the ongoing genocidal war against Ukraine. But can you just make a country that size a democracy when it has no modern tradition of democratic culture? Well, I believe uh, that there is no people on earth that is somehow unfit for democracy. That would be a very wrong thing to say on so many levels. I don't want even to begin. I, you I know, don't mean unfit, but I mean 
Practically speaking, to deliver a democracy, you need to have a culture of democracy. You need to have political parties, people who are prepared to speak out, people who want to be activists. Well, I want to say that, uh, you know, the the uh, new generation, that generation that grew up under Vladimir Putin, that was born and grew up under Vladimir Putin, the younger generation, um, they uh, they did not leave. Uh, they did not leave behind an iron curtain. So they were able to travel throughout these years and they know how things can be in a democratic country. And uh, yes, of course, if we talk about the present Russian government, it is untransformable. You cannot make it somehow into a democracy. No. And these people who have been stealing and killing to protect that stolen wealth and political assassination it has been used as a method of dealing with the opposition for years in Russia. Um, so that those people, they need to stand trial. They need to put to be put on trial for all the atrocities that have been committed against the Russian people and against our neighbors. Um, so we're not talking about somehow reforming this one. Yeah. We're talking about completely changing um, the, the political system in the country. But do you feel that that is, you know, it's this question of what is achievable? Because what seems to me to be happening around the world now is that there are whole regions of the world, the Middle East, China, where democracy is not the goal. They don't want democracy because they, I, I mean, there you can't speak for a whole country, but I mean, you know, th there is no great sign of this upwelling of demand for democracy in these countries because these are countries that are functioning, they are developing, people have, you know, reasonable lives or in improving lives. And, um, what 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 were you imagined 20 years ago that the whole world would just demand democracy because that's the only way to live it hasn't happened and and so because it suits certain people it suits certain circles uh in power i don't think you know uh ronald reagan in his westminster speech here in the uk in london said that it would be cultural condescension or worse to say that any people would choose dictatorship over democracy. So I do not believe that there is a people on this earth that voluntarily would choose dicta a dictatorship. That is, that goes against everything. Who wants to live in poverty? Who wants his or her rights being violated on a daily basis? Who wants this insecurity about your life and the life of your kids? Who wants to have, to not be able to plan ahead because you don't know what your government is going to throw at you? Who wants to live like that? So uh, I believe that the, uh, the question is whether it's difficult. And yes, of course it is difficult, but is it impossible? No. In Russia, the problem is not the expanse of the territory. It's the way, uh, it's, it's the system of government. I'm not a politician, um, so I don't want to go into detail. Don't ask me how these particular things need to be done. But I understand that Russia cannot um, remain a presidential republic, that's for sure. It has to be a parliamentary republic. It has to be a parliamentary system where no one, not one person, will be ever able to um, get all the power in his or her hands ever again. That's the first thing. And uh, where parliament will actually become a place for discussion and uh, where parliament in parliament will be uh, these members of parliament who will be actually representing the interests of their constituents, uh, of their voters. So that's, it's an entirely rotten system that has to be changed. So I understand that that's the macro picture, the big picture. Yeah. And of course, if you could deliver democracy and devolution and federalism, then all the political prisoners are well, freed. But in the meantime, you have a campaign to run to try and seek other ways Yep, to, but, free, uh, to free individuals like your husband. Of course. And, you know, I again, I'm not a politician, so I would not be able to give you a program of tomorrow's Russia. This is why people like Vladimir, who are visionaries, need to be saved. Yeah. It is up to us Russians to change the political system in the country. But in order for us to be able to do that, 
when this present regime collapses. We first need to survive. Somehow survive. We cannot do this without the support and solidarity of the Western democratic world of which we very much want to be part. And that, of course, takes me to my sort of smaller campaign, talking about specific people, telling their stories, making sure that these political prisoners are not forgotten, that their struggle is recognized and that everything is done to protect these people, to save their lives, to make sure that the world knows who the real criminals are and that the world, the democratic world, will go after these specific criminals and bring them to responsibility. And uh, there are several um, instruments uh, to, to do that, including the Magnitsky sanctions. That is a revolutionary instrument that allows uh, those democracies to go after specific human rights violators and uh, uh, freeze their assets and ban them from entering democratic countries to enjoy the privileges that the free world guarantees to its citizens. Um, and these Magnitsky sanctions, besides doing all that, also send a very clear message to others, to other would-be uh, human rights violators, that they should probably think twice before engaging in such practices. So do you feel the, the, the Magnitsky powers are not being used? They are being used, but not to the extent they should be used. And, um, you know, it's a, when th this campaign began, I remember um, in 2010, the first few years, it seemed like everyone was saying, well, no country will ever adopt such a legislation. It's just don't even... And yet today, 35 countries have the Magnitsky legislation. And uh, the Magnitsky uh, legislation today is not only used to go after human rights violators in Russia. There is a global Magnitsky Act that allows these democracies to bring to responsibility human rights violators from all over the world. And recently, I was at some event with some Iranian activists and they were talking about the importance of using the Magnitsky sanctions against uh, human rights violators in Iran. And I thought, oh my God, this is so good. This is um, in part the product of my husband's work. And this is so good to know that the world now has this revolutionary instrument that actually completely changed the narrative. Um, instead of going on to, uh, after entire countries, there's, the democratic world can go after specific human rights violators, meaning identifying these people. You, it's, it's not happening to the extent it is, that it's actually bringing enough pressure to bear to make them think the, about uh, The Magnitsky the legislation, the Magnitsky uh, sanctions only will not topple the regime in the Kremlin. It cannot be thought like that. It's going to be a combination of different factors. Mm -hmm. And the first and foremost is Ukraine's victory. On I mean, Ukraine's terms. It's, it's, it's admirable the way you answer every question that I try, I try and bring you to Vladimir and you go bigger every time. You know, you go democracy, because, you go the world. And his fight is bigger. Yes, I understand that. I understand. But does that mean that you have effectively decided or accepted that he's not going to be released? Oh, no. Oh, no. I will, uh, the idea was to raise the kids together. You know, so, so I need him back in the picture doing his part. No. Um, so how are you going to do that? I'm going to be as loud as I possibly can. And I'm going to call on uh, democratic countries to use every means possible to um, get him out of prison. So give us and, a British example then. I mean, what, what would you like Britain or the government of Britain to do? Okay, and we are going to go again larger. I'm sorry, but it, it affects Vladimir's fate as well as many others. And uh, my husband has never been about something small, you know, and uh, in continuing his work, I also have to look at a big picture and how this will affect many people. This is important to me uh, because I have been devastated by by the war of aggression against Ukraine. I have been devastated by seeing our friends and uh, colleagues end up either in forced exile or in Russian prison. So to me, the picture is also bigger. I have been a good, I think, student of my husband over the years, and he sort of taught me to look at the bigger picture and 
Sorry, but that's... No, no, I mean, it's, it's fascinating um, and it's admirable. Um, but, but so, I mean, I kind let's of wonder, talk about as a, as the a, UK. As a wife trying to get her husband yeah. free. So, uh, uh, over my um, travels, I've uh, noticed one thing, is that um, the global crisis of political prisoners and hostage-taking is ever-growing. It's just, it's on the rise. But it seems that um, world democracies are not equipped to deal with it. The UK government's position has been basically to ignore these. If a hostage is taken, uh, basically, you know, with a British passport, you're out of luck. Because the British government doesn't negotiate with terrorists. Because the British government does not negotiate. So in their um, approach, well, yes, if you are taken hostage like Nazanin Ratcliffe, Bonnie Ratcliffe was, you are out of luck. You're there on one on one with this autocratic regime and it can kill you, but your country is not going to get engaged and try to get you out. So you see, it's it's is this approach ethically, morally acceptable? I don't believe it is. Whether democracies are prepared or not to deal with the ever growing uh, hostage taking crisis, it will continue grow, growing. So the problem will continue being on the rise and democracies will just not be equipped to deal with it. So I, um, uh, for example, the US has an office for hostage affairs. And there is a specific position, a specific envoy, presidential envoy for hostage affairs. Um, and there is a specific law that um, introduces a list of um, criteria that a person has to meet in order to in order for this presidential envoy to get engaged in the case and start using all available instruments to save this person's life and bring him back home. So her, do you have a better chance of being brought home if you're an American hostage? Well, yes, it it is. You do have a better, definitely better chance because there is a law that says that this office will get engaged in your case and will advocate for you if you meet a set of criteria. So obviously, yeah, you don't have to be an American citizen for that to happen. No, you just have to have, um, uh, yes, either an American citizenship or close connection to the country or, and there is a, a set, like 11 criteria that you have to meet. So they could take up Vladimir's case then? They could and they should, and I will be pushing for that. But uh, as I told you, the picture is bigger. The UK government is obviously not equipped to deal with any of this. And its position of ignoring the problem is obviously not the solution. These people will die, and the British government says that, you know what, sorry. Do you think so, they really ignore? Because what they would say is, look, we work behind the scenes. We don't talk about these things publicly. You know, Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe did come home in the end. Um, we paid the money. Uh, what do you, you know, is that not the truth? In order for that to happen, Richard Ratcliffe had to go on hunger strike. That should not have happened. And Nazanin should not have spent six years in that prison. She missed six years of her daughter's life. Those are irreplaceable. As a mom of three, I know that those are irreplaceable. And I know how heartbroken Vladimir now is about being completely, you know, just torn away from his kids. It should not happen in this way. You, you said the British government's position is basically to do nothing. Is, is that your experience? You know, what, what happens when you go to the British government and say, can you help? You know what, I'm very grateful to the British government for introducing sanctions against uh, uh, five of Vladimir's persecutors, uh, those people involved in the illegal persecution. Um, I am grateful, uh, but it is slightly baffling to me that... Canada was the first country to introduce sanctions against Vladimir's persecutors, not the UK. Vladimir is a UK citizen. That step by Canada was then followed by the United States and only then the UK. I am grateful and these people should indeed be sanctioned.
should have been sanctioned probably years ago for their involvement in other cases as well. But I would love to see stronger action. I mean, you, you're a tremendously strong advocate. You know, whenever you're on television, I think people are just kind of, sort of blown away by your, the power of your voice. Do you feel alone right now? It depends. <laughs> I mean, I have a lot of support around the world. Wherever I come, I'm welcomed with open hands because of Vladimir's work, because he is so beloved and respected, um, because he's, he's earned that respect through years and years of his principled, strong and... Um, uh, through the years of his work against the regime. And um, so people sort of, by extension, they welcome me. And I'm very grateful to all of these people. I've, ma I've made a lot of friends and I've found many allies in my fight for Vladimir's release and for Vladimir's cause around the world. And I'm truly, deeply grateful to all of them. But of course, uh, I also feel lonely not because I somehow, um, you know, lack attention, but because Vladimir is not here. We've been inseparable for what we've been married for 20 years. And throughout all of these years, we've been very, very close. We discuss everything. We just, uh, you know, we, all the decisions um, that concern the family or even work, we, we make together. Um, I've been editing his um, articles uh, for years. Um, uh, I've been, you know, I am, I am helpless without him in terms of, oh, you know, those bureaucratic matters. I've always been bad at this and I've hated that. He, he's always the one who makes sure that our passports are updated, that all the, you know, all the needed documents are signed, that, you know, just all of that. And I'm absolutely clueless about that part. I'm just like, ugh. Now I've, of course, over the past year, I've had to learn to, to do all of that as well. But I miss him terribly. And it's just, you know, he's my, he's my teammate. He's my, my partner, my partner for life. I chose to spend my life with this particular man. So having him torn away from me and the kids like that is very, very painful, deeply painful. And I'm, I don't know, in that sense, I am lonely because there are things that I would only discuss with him. Even though I, I have friends and uh, there are things that I want to discuss with just him. And um, I don't know, I miss our breakfast together. I miss him uh, cooking for us on the weekends. Um, and just said that's, uh, it's been a family tradition when during uh, uh, spring and summer months he would... Uh, cook for us, he would grill meat and uh, the kids invite their friends and we invite uh, our friends and the house is full and everyone is fed and happy and it is just what we can sit at the table chatting for hours and hours at the end, at an end and it's just, uh, I miss all that. I miss him being in the house working in his home office you know, just clanking on his computer and um, miss his voice. This whole conversation has been about change and how you deliver it. Of the things we talked about, what is the, what is the one thing that, would, that you would change? I would love to, for Vladimir Putin to never have been able to come to power in our country. But that's like, you know, that's the realm of fantasy. I don't deal with fantasies, honestly. Um, it's difficult for me to think about that. Um, and this, I cannot this is now even a hard say, path. yes, well, it's uh, never been easy in our country, but it does not mean again that it's impossible. And also, I cannot even say that I would have loved for Vladimir to never ha have gone back to Russia after the full scale invasion, because I understand that had he stayed home, he would have withered and died. It's, it's, he's not, he wouldn't have been able to look at himself in the mirror. That would have, would have been someone else, not my husband, someone else. 
and I married this particular guy, so I can't even wish for that. You know, it's... I will take it, you know, I will take each day as each day comes, I guess, and deal with each day as each day comes and try to do my best. I don't know if my work will bring results, but I will continue doing my best and I will do my best to put my small nail in the coffin of this regime. My nail will probably not be the last, but someone's nail will be. Evgenia Karamosa, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for having me here.